Hello everyone and welcome to week two. Our lecture this week is entitled Folk Linguistics and I'll explain what that means here later in the presentation. But when we talk about linguistics, again, we define linguistics as the study of language. And it's not just the study and investigation of language by observing and thinking, ooh, that's interesting. But actually, linguistics follows the scientific method. You know, so hypothesizing, data collection, data analysis. So in many ways, and in every way, linguistics is actually considered a science. While at UNT Dallas, I know the linguistics courses are in the School of Education. And at Texas A&M University Commerce, all the linguistics courses are under the Department of Literature and Languages. You'll find other universities where linguistics classes are actually under the sciences. Because of its methodology and its approach to research, it's considered a scientific field of study. Linguistics is also different from an English class, where in those types of courses you might be taught how to write a certain way, such as a composition and rhetoric course, or you may be in lit a literature course and theorizing over historical literature. Linguistics is also different from a speech or communications course where they're going to teach you how to orate or deliver speeches a certain way for a certain setting. So unlike those courses, in linguistics, we're not teaching you how to write or how to speak in a certain way. In linguistics, in linguistics, we call that prescribing. Think about your doctor prescribing you medicine. Your doctor says, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to take to feel better. In writing courses or oral communication courses, your instructor says, this is what you need to write better or to speak better, right? Prescribing is when someone says, here's a method that you need to follow to be better at X, to be better at something. Linguists, on the other hand, are not prescribers. We may be interested in describing the type of language used in presentations and in academic writing versus regular conversation or text messages, but we're going to describe what is happening in those environments and not say, this is right or this is wrong. And with this approach, we are able to identify really unique things happening in our society with language. As linguists, we look at all aspects aspects of speech, from the smallest sound in a language all the way through the larger meaning of text, and I'll explain more about that on the next slide. But the last thing I want to stress is that linguists are primarily interested in casual spoken language. We call this authentic language, authentic discourse. We don't only look at this, but this is what we are the most interested in. And this is the area we are going to investigate in this class. A quick summary of the fields of linguistics. These are the five core areas of language that linguists like to explore. Those are listed here in the left column on the slide. Phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. These are called the five pillars. And through our work this semester, you'll actually get a taste of each of them. Phonology deals with the sounds in a language. For example, we have 44 sounds in the English language. Morphology deals with the smallest units of meaning in a language. So for example, if I say the word dog, you probably think of a small fluffy pet-like creature. If I add an S to say dogs, you are now thinking of multiple small fluffy pet-like creatures. Morphology is interested in how a word can morph or form to take on new meaning, such as adding the S to dog. In syntax, we are concerned with what makes a sentence, so the structure of phrases and the rules that guide these structures. In semantics, we look at the meaning of words. For example, dog can mean a domestic animal, but used differently, it can mean an unpleasant or wicked person, such as calling a person a dog. Finally, we have pragmatics. I gave the example in my introductory video this week of the flight attendant who said, y'all come back now and her passengers turned around and came back to the plane. This is a great example of a pragmatic issue, which has to do the, with the meaning of the speaker. In this case, what the flight attendant actually meant when she had said this. Her passengers understood the phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics of what she said. They did not understand the pragmatics, the message behind what the meaning of y'all come back now was. They heard this as an order to do something, but she meant it essentially as a farewell. 
while we explore these five core pillars of linguistics, we're going to look at them through the lens, the macro lens of sociolinguistics. Sociolinguistics is the study of how our roles in society influence language. In short, it's looking at language through the lens of sociology, through human society and the roles that humans play. We each play a lot of social roles. For example, gender, age, and class can have an impact on your place in society. Looking at this list, what kind of doors were open or closed for you based on the various social roles or social groups you belong to? When we talk about group membership, the last item on the list, this can include things like ethnicity and class, but it can also include things like, were you a football player in high school or did you do theater? What were the social groups you belonged to? And a lot of, the, a lot of these are influenced by your hobbies or your interests. So our goal in this class and what we're hoping for is that you experience some type of paradigm shift in your assumptions regarding language and language use. We've all been told that there is a correct way of speaking or using English, and then there is an incorrect way of using English. However, there is a time and a place for all varieties of English. For example, the use of some slang or cursing which typically is regarded as incorrect or bad or impolite English, actually can mark your membership to some communities. So there is no wrong English. There's just the language that is appropriate or called for in certain groups and places, and that's what we're discussing in this class. Let's look at one case of evidence. This article is by Sarah Larson in The New Yorker entitled Ha 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 versus He He He, and it was published in 2015. And this is a great piece to help recognize how people form their attitudes about language. She writes, the terms of e-laughter, ha ha ha, ho ho, he he, and he, are implicitly understood by just about everyone, but in recent years, there's been an increasing popular newcomer called he he. Not surprisingly, it's been foisted upon us by youth. What does it mean? I've highlighted in the slide the area she says it's been foisted upon us by youth because here she is taking the position that e-laughter, so laughter used in electronic communication, is being used quite a bit and its popularity comes from young people. So let's keep that in mind. Next, she says, I think it's he he, our conspiratorial buddy, sweetly shortened to ha ha, length in a slightly bizarre way. It is more a masculine he he, literally a bunch of he's. Is it a squashed up he with some filigree? Is it a cross between ha ha, he he, and he? While I'm ha ha my way in the middle age, younger people have coined a new laugh. Good for them. So with that last statement there, she has self-identified herself as a middle-aged woman and is making the claim that men do this type of he he laughter more than women. And remember, in addition to that claim, she has already asserted that younger people are doing this more than older people. So a few months later, a blogger decided to respond to Larson's article, and they wrote, Several weeks ago, Sarah Larson from The New Yorker published a fun article about e-laughter. Curious as to whether her usage followed up-to-date social norms, she consulted her savvy friends for answers. Anecdotally, she found that laughter tended to vary by age and gender. This blogger is really picking up on Larson's claims. They write, she consulted her savvy friends for answers. That right there is the definition of anecdotal evidence. You just hear stuff from your friends and you assume that it's true. So next, this blogger wrote, but why rely on anecdotes when you have data? 
bringing in linguistics, the scientific method, right? We analyzed de-identified posts and comments posted on Facebook in the last week of May with at least one string of characters matching laughter. We did the matching with regular expressions which automatically identified laughter in the text, including variants of ha ha, he he, emojis, and lol. So let's look at those results. So if you look at this graph on the right, you see listed at the bottom, emoji, ha ha, he he, and lol. And on the left of the graph, it represents the age of the user using it. So what age are the people that are using these various e-laughters? And the dotted line represents the average age of that particular usage. So if you look closer at it, it does appear that younger people use emojis more than older people. But contrary to what Larson claimed, is that he he is actually being used, not by much, but is being used more than ha ha by older folks. And you can see in the graph that the dotted line is higher for he he than ha ha. So here is some real data and some real evidence that goes against what Larson had claimed. Now let's look at Larson's claim about men. So looking at this graph on the right, men are represented by the color green and women by the color purple. And very slightly, you can see that men do use he he more than women, which is what Larson had claimed. But the difference between men and women using he he is nothing compared to the difference between men and the use of ha ha or women and the use of emojis. LOL and he he are kind of neck and neck. So yes, Larson may have been onto something, but in scientific research, we are looking for statistical significance. And we can see more of the significance in ha ha and the use of emojis than in looking at he he and LOL. So bottom line, men are not using he he much more often than women, which challenges Larson's, Larson's initial claim. So comparing the two studies we just looked at, and one we can't even call a study, which was Larson's, there's two types of evidence that people are going to offer you. There's anecdotal, which was Larson's study, which was hearsay or observations, but not a sci scientific approach to answer specific research questions. She didn't have any evidence. She just pulled together the resources in her immediate world and tried to make a claim on those. Alternatively, what the blogger offered us was empirical research. This is how we describe a scientific study, as empirical research. We're not necessarily talking about capturing language in a lab, like a scientific lab. Alternatively, most of what we observe and study is in real authentic situations. But empirical research is going to offer us a better, closer truth of what's actually going on with language than an anecdotal approach to research would offer us. So when we talked about anecdotal information, such as Larson's piece, we can transition to our conversation on folk linguistics. Folk linguistics is when non-professionals we can say Larson, I guess, <laughs> make language evaluations without scientific information. These folk linguistic beliefs or anecdotes, as Larson came up with, they are commonly believed opinions and perceptions about language in our society. And these concepts and opinions have circulated so well that we just believe them. And I'll show you on the next slide, you'll see how, yes, even you just believe in some of these anecdotes and folk linguistic concepts. So typically these concepts rely heavily, heavily on anecdotal evidence such as Larson's study, and we just accept that anecdotal evidence as evidence and accept them therefore as truth, and we dismiss empirical evidence. So let's look at some examples. So the first one, women talk more than men. All right, that's a pretty fine hypothesis or proposition, and we can go out and research it, but to be honest, the results are much more complicated than imagined. So when women or groups of women are speaking, you would probably want to count all the words they say in every minute or every hour, and likewise, you would do this with a group of men. And there's a lot of variation, but really what they found was that you would be surprised at how chatty men get when they are with a bunch of buddies. 
But then we would want to look at how much women talk and how much men talk when they are in a mixed group conversation. So at this juncture, context is everything. If you're at work and 10 people are around a conference table, let's say eight of them are women, they have observed that men are likely to say very little because they feel outnumbered. But the reverse is also true. So if you are with eight men and two women, the women tend to speak less for the same reason. So now let's imagine a different context. You have three couples, so three men, three women, out on a triple date. And in this context, men have been shown to actually take the floor more and talk more for longer periods of time than the women. In a sense, the women report that they kind of feel expected to listen to the men's stories and that they may be rude to take the floor from someone telling a story. So once again, to this opinion that women talk more than men, it's all context dependent. Setting is important. And that applies to the next examples. So the belief that women talk more than men is an old adage. Maybe there's some truth to it, but it's not entirely accurate. But it's a common saying or thought that we hold in our society that we accept to be true. Looking at the next one, people that use the word ain't are poor and uneducated. Okay, so here we would do another study where we take people from different social classes and educational backgrounds and keep track of who uses ain't and how much they use it. But again, this is tricky because often you'll find that people in politics and highly educated professionals will use this word strategically to build camaraderie with a social group that maybe they're hoping to pull votes or support from. And they use this word to give the perception that they're down to earth, normal folk, just like the voting class. So once again, it's hard to take this statement as a blank, blanket truth because people use words like this strategically. Finding objective data in all of these instances is a challenge, such as Southerners speak the worst English, abonics and slang are the same thing, people that like say like are so annoying, and cursing is proof that you have a small vocabulary. A lot of these things we have accepted as truth, but unless you take a real scientific approach to any of these assertions, we don't know if they're proven or disproven. And in all of these cases, there is a certain amount of bias. So what we're really looking at on these past slides are attitudes about dialects. And sociolinguistics takes the stand that whatever anyone ever says about dialect, they're really saying that thing about the people that tend to speak that dialect. This is what we call perceptual dialectology. So these folk linguistic elements we just spoke about People who have made those comments, they're not saying anything about the language. They're not really scientific evidence of the language. They're talking about the people group that is underneath that language. So this is where these topics get really political and kind of uncomfortable because we're now labeling people groups. When those little antidotes we just read talk about the uneducated or race or gender and it's tied to language use, they're not commenting on analyzed data that was handled scientifically with the objective to learn, about, to learn more about language. They're commenting on those people groups. So I have a video for you to watch which is provided for you as a link on the Canvas screen where you found this lecture. This is a guy from Michigan State um, who did the same thing you guys are doing with your dialect surveys, also known as your map assignment due for Section 2B. He interviewed people and asked them where correct English was spoken and where pleasant English was spoken. So pause this lecture, go take a look at that video real quick, and then come back to this lecture. So here's a picture of the map he would have used to have people circle their answers. And here are some of the results. The darker colors are where the participants from Michigan had identified the most correct English. So the states that these individuals had said, these are the states where people speak the most correct English. And alternatively, the white or the dotted colors are where the same respondents had said, this is where people speak the least correct English. So it's really important to realize that this map represents the answers given by the residents of Michigan. So everyone's answers on this map are people who live in Michigan. 
Therefore, it's no surprise that they rank themselves, the Michigan area, as speaking the most correct English. And they also ranked high the states around them, so the darker gray, a little lighter than their own state. So the states around them, they also ranked high as correct English. But notice the bias against the South. So from Texas to Georgia, they have scores of four or lower. But now let's look at a map of people from Alabama. So remember, the last map represents answers from Michigan residents, and this map represents answers from Alabama residents. And while Alabama didn't rank themselves as the highest in correct English, they definitely didn't rank themselves as the lowest, which in the previous slide, Michigan had rated them very, very low. Also interesting on this map is that they listed Maryland and surrounding states as using the most correct English. So if we look at the next slide here, these are also still respondents from Alabama. But they were then asked the question, where do you think pleasant English is spoken? So one thing to point out here is that people do indeed see those as two separate questions. Where is correct English spoken and where is pleasant English spoken? They see those as completely different topics and completely different types of English. So in this case, Alabama respondents rank themselves as the highest as having the most pleasant English. And if you remember on the last slide, they ranked Maryland as the state with the most correct English. But on this slide, they ranked Maryland as one of the states with the least polite English. So that's really interesting observation about people's perspectives. People typically see politeness as, especially in those from the South, as more of a homegrown, warm, and comfy type of language. It's very interaction based. So very interesting results when we look at these two questions. And if you guys have looked at the second assignment for this week, you'll see that you are also going to be doing your own field work just like this. So in conclusion to this lecture, there are two main points. One is that we as a society hold a lot of opinions about language and accept a lot of folk linguistic ideas without having access to the research, the data, and knowing whether or not those are proven or disproven. Instead, we have accepted those anecdotes as truth, and that is something we want to move away from in this class. Let's look at truth. Let's look at what's really happening with the language. The second conclusion is that people tend to find their own home dialect to be the most pleasant, to be the best one to listen to. And that's why in the previous slide, Alabama listed themselves as the most pleasant because the reality is at the end of the day, we find the most pleasant, relaxing type of language to be our own, to be our own voice and the dialect in which we've grown up in. I'll see you guys next week for week three. Contact me if you have any questions.